Good afternoon. I thought I might just well welcome myself right there. Um, it's just one of those things, isn't it? No, 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 no. I wasn't waiting for that. It's good. It's good to see everyone here. And uh, good afternoon to you who are here for the first time and everyone who's here has been here as part of City Gates for a while. And I just want to say that it's just so amazing to see what God is doing at City Gates. Um, at least I'm amazed. Um, a year ago, we started our Saturday evening um, runway. It's amazing that right now, we will be, on next Sunday, we'll be celebrating one year um, of that, that amazing runway established. It's pumping, it's thriving, and God is with us, isn't it? For those of you who go to a Saturday evening meeting, raise up your hand. Who's there? Why are you here? I'm kidding. <laughs> isn't it amazing over there? It's amazing that God is doing that, so let's support, let's stand with the guys on Saturday, but also today, today, this afternoon, later this afternoon, we'll be going across to Dara because we'll be launching that, uh, fully officially launching Dara. Who's part of Dara here? No one, okay. There are a couple of people at the back there. Just to say for you guys, that's where you belong, Okay. So be true to where you actually belong. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but we would be doing that. So if you want to go there and support and be part of that, that would be fantastic. God is doing something amazing, isn't it? Um, it's not so long ago that uh, it was just uh, two churches coming together. Now we have five runways that meet every weekend, five meetings across the city. We have four here at, at uh, Paradigm and one over there. Who knows what comes next? It's amazing. The other thing I just want to let you know is that there's so much that's going to happen leading up to convergence, and also at convergence as well. I realized I ran over to Peter and said, you know, I missed something for, uh, that I was supposed to announce um, last, at the last meeting in the morning at 9 a.m. Um, this is what I want you to remember. I want you to remember this, that next Sunday, um, is going to be quite significant. And the Sunday after that, and also the Sunday after that. Okay, let me tell you why I say this. Next Sunday, let's see if you remember a while ago when we brought the whole church together and we did a vision morning and we met at one of the hotels. If you remember, do you still remember that? Before we went away for the summer, or some of you, um, we came together, we shared the vision of the church, and one of the things that we did when we did that, we said it's a moment now that the elders who were leading in the transition are now going to step down in order that as we come into a new wineskin of city gates, we'll now appoint elders. So next Sunday, as well as Saturday, I will be standing right here and, and announcing um, the elders and everyone who's going to be carrying all our runways for the future. All right? You are welcome to clap. <laughs> so that's it. No, I wasn't calling for clap, but I thought it really does deserve that. But anyway, um, but that's next Sunday. So please mark the date. I've reminded you that. The second, the, the Sunday after that, or the weekend after that, we are going to have a lot of the people who are coming for convergence, some of them are coming a week early. So on Sunday, we have Steve and Heather Oliver, who is going to be here with us. We have David and Sila, uh, David Devonish, and they're going to be preaching on, a, on, on Sunday. So one is going to do the first meeting and the other the second meeting. So you're not allowed to do, to do both or to ask me who's doing what. You come to the meeting, you're meant to come. You're going to receive the word of God regardless, okay? And then even Saturday night, we have uh, Mike Irving who's going to come and speak and uh, also even for our Russian uh, congregation or Russian runway as well, we have um, someone. So we, and Dara as well, we have JW who's coming to preach. So it's very significant that uh, we'll be having the nations and people from the nations who are coming to serve us in all the sessions. Remember that. 
okay? And then we have convergence, which is going to happen from the 15th, if you remember, so Friday evening, so it's going to happen Sunday, Saturday, full day. Sunday, we'll have one meeting, which is going to be at 9 a.m. in the morning. This is at the hotel, but it's for those who have registered for convergence. And then there's another meeting, which is going to happen at 11.30. Did I get the timing right? And that meeting is where we're going to be laying hands on elders and releasing them. And it's going to be a full house because all of us are going to be together, but also all our visitors from around the world are going to be with us. So make sure you are there, make sure you are early, and make sure you are dressed up. It's going to be such a fantastic time. Amen? Amen. Now, that's where we're going, and I hope you made a mental note of everything I said, and you will remember now, if you got your Bible, please turn with me to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. So what we are doing here is we are going through this series. This is the second installment to our Trinity series. And we started last week where we are looking at God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And last week, Nyasha was fantastic in the way that he led us and preached the Word of God with such incredible authority and clarity, and it was amazing. And he focused on the Father, and today is the second installment on the Father, and then for two more weeks, we'll be looking at the Son, and then two more weeks after that, we'll be looking at the Holy Spirit, just to say... Uh, two weeks on the Father doesn't do justice to, uh, or the Son, and uh, Jacob, <laughs> we, <laughs> you were having a conversation, so where do I start if I'm doing uh, two weeks on the Son? Uh, but we just want to give a very good foundation of the Trinity or the triune God. Amen? So that's where we're going. So today, we're going to be focusing on God the Father. That's where we're going. And uh, can I, instead of... Uh, Instead of just me praying before we start, can I ask that we all pray um, together? One of the things that's happening today is one of the unique things that's ever, never happened in my life is that I'm preaching five times today. So this is the second time. No, 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 not all the runways. And then tonight I'm preaching in Montana twice in two services. And the last preach is at 11 o'clock at night. So I really need your prayer. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to Dara, and that's a preach today. I need the power of God to maintain all of that, and uh, I've never done this before, so I just want to say that. But anyway, can we pray? Let's pray for God's strength, but also pray that God will open your heart, that you re receive the word of God. When you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Father, we, we just want to thank you so much for all you are doing here at City Gates I want to thank you for what's going to happen next week and the week after that and the week after that. We thank you that you are building your church. We thank you for Saturday night and it's just been a year since we started. And Lord, we thank you for the fruit over there. Thank you for the DERA runway and what you are doing there today, Lord, as we officially launch. You've been with them. And Lord, I pray now, would you build up, Lord, the Sunday morning meeting and the 9 a.m. and the 11.30, would you do something powerful here? Lord, even as we look ahead into convergence, I pray for a fruitful time for all of us. Father, as we hear your word, come and speak to us and speak through us. Holy Spirit, come and teach us and bring revelation to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. They, we are looking at Trinity. We are focusing on the Father. Let me just say this. One of the things that's happened in, in, over the last 2,000 years is that the, the Trinity has come under a lot of attack or skewed understanding and distortion on the whole understanding of who God is. If there's one thing that the enemy wants to do is to distort our thinking so that we don't understand who God is. And uh, we've seen that right across. If you look at the history of Christianity, this doctrine has really come under a lot of attack. The, one of the things that has happened, and at least in the second century, uh, was that there was a man called Masion, and Masion was from uh, what we would call modern-day Turkey. Um, he's a place from, called Sinop, and uh, he was... Uh, 
he was a, a very bright man. So Masion um, decided that uh, he doesn't like the idea of the God of the Bible being the same God of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Masion believed that the God of the Old Testament was this Demiurge, and the God of the New Testament was this benevolent God. So the Old Testament God was this malevolent God, which means he was, uh, he was a hard taskmaster warlord, and the one of the New Testament was nice. Marcion believed that there were two gods. The first one was the one who created things, and, uh, and it was a harsh, full of wrath kind of God. Marcion believed that the, the new God, which is the God of the New Testament, is the one that brought Jesus to the earth to die on the cross for us. So he basically looked at the Bible and decided that there's stuff he doesn't like in the Bible and the stuff he does like. And we can think about Marcion and think, okay, this, he's a weird guy, but actually, the number of times that we do that in our minds is, 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 is unbelievable, where we pick and choose or what we like about God rather than actually receiving him for who he is. And sometimes we want to create the kind of God like Marcion has created in his mind where it's not the God of the Bible, but it's the God of our thinking. And I believe that God wants to speak to us today and say, it's not your kind of God that you create, it's the God of the heavens and the earth. And the God of the heavens and the earth is the one of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament who reveals himself through Jesus Christ. So what Marcion ended up doing practically is that he took the Bible and he removed everything about the Old Testament. He didn't want to hear about this Demiurge, this malevolent God, and he only left a little bit of the New Testament. What he left was he left the Gospel of Luke and he also left all the writings of Paul. And everything else he thought shouldn't be in the Bible. You see what he has done there? He's undermined in the triune God, the Father, who the Father is. Thinking that the Father did, it shouldn't be the one that's in the Old Testament, should be in the New Testament. This happens a lot, and even now there's this uh, understanding called New Marcionism, which is a Marcion, uh, the understanding of making God in our own thinking, in our own minds, and abandoning or jettisoning the God of the Bible. That's why it's important for us to preach about the Trinity so we fully understand who God is. Amen? It's the second theory was this one called modalism. Modalism is a, is a concept that there is, there's a belief that there's one God, and one God who's in heaven, but this God actually manifests himself in three forms or in three modes. Sometimes he reveals himself as father, and sometimes he reveals himself as son, and sometimes he reveals himself as spirit. So many people will believe that, no, 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 there's one God, but actually, this is a type, the way he reveals himself in this context, he will reveal himself as uh, son, because he can relate to him as son. The way he revealed himself in this context, he will reveal himself as spirit, almost like the father stands there and just kind of reveals a different image of himself. But actually, no, that's not how the Bible calls it. The Bible is very clear that the Father is God, the Son is God, not a form of God or a mode that God changes into in order to appear and appeal in that context. There's another theory as well which came through a man called Arius who was uh, a bishop of a place called Alexandria in Egypt. This man believed that uh, the God that we know and we worship now, Arius, the God that we know and worship right now, he is God, but actually, he didn't believe that the Son was God, and he didn't believe that the Spirit was God. You see how the gospel of the Trinity, or the, sorry, the doctrine of the Trinity can be undermined. So he believed that because the Bible speaks of the Son as the begotten from the Father, he believed that Jesus was made by the Father. He wasn't there in the beginning. So immediately what has been compromised and undermined is not God the Father in this context, but it's God the Son, but also he didn't believe that the Holy Spirit was fully God. In undermining one or the other, in undermining anything about the Trinity, we are undermining the whole of the Godhead. And that's the important thing for us to understand. And then there was another man um, who was the third president 
of the United States, a man called Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, who, um, he, he wrote what we call the Declaration of Independence, and basically saying, it's time for us to kick the Brits out of America. If you are British here, you'll understand the Declaration of Independence is about saying, hey guys, we don't want you to rule over us anymore. And he wrote that, but Jefferson believed that, um, he believed that there is a God, he believed that there was a Father who is God, but actually he didn't believe in anything that is miraculous or miracles in the Bible. So he took the Bible, and that's how he came up with what we call the Jefferson Bible, he took the Bible and he cut bits that he didn't like in the Bible that were about miracles. And some of those miracles are the miracles that speak of who God is. So for instance, he didn't like the concept of Jesus being born of a virgin. So the whole thing was removed um, because he didn't believe that that miracle is possible that you could be born of a virgin. Suddenly, the, so much of the triune God has been undermined. He also, are you still with me? Okay, okay, I was just checking that. Oh, goodness, all right, the room is so quiet. <laughs> and he removed that. And then he, he realized that it's not just about God coming to earth. It's about the whole thing of Jesus being the son of God. He, he felt that like if God is God, there is no way that he will have a son who walks the earth. So he removed all of that. The son has been compromised as part of the triune God in the whole thing. And then the third thing he removed, um, many, many things, by the way, but the things that are very significant to the Bible and to Christianity, he removed the concept of the resurrection. Because in his mind, this whole thing, this miracle of resurrection, of uh, someone who dies and actually rises from the dead, didn't make sense to him. Because it doesn't make sense to him, it needs to be removed from the Bible. You realize how you can easily have your Bible, you can easily hold true to your Bible, but actually you are so picky and choosy on the kind of God you want to receive rather than the God of the Bible. And that's why it's so important for us to really take the Bible very seriously and actually understand who God is through the Bible. And Jefferson wrote what we call the Jefferson Bible. And he thought, this is my Bible, and he, he obviously you know, distributed it. It's interesting that he, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he, he reasoned and he talks in the Declaration or writes in the Declaration about the Almighty God. The interesting thing is that you can talk about God, but actually the question is, which God are you talking about? And sometimes we use the word God, and we use God in a lot of ways. The, understand, the question is, which God are we referring to? Are we referring to the God of our limited thinking? Are we referring to the God of heaven who we can't fully understand, but we accept him for who he is? And I just want to challenge us as city gates right now. If we make a pocket God, the one that we can understand and put it in our pocket and get him out every time when we need help, that is not the God of the Bible. It might be the case that right now, even as we speak, you have created a God that you can understand. But actually, I've read a book the God I can't understand, I don't fully understand him. But I tell you what, one day there's so much I don't understand, I'm going to understand. And one day when I see him, suddenly I'm going to say, now it makes sense that you are who you are. Let's not make God in our own image or in our concept of thinking and all that. Let's acknowledge and accept that we serve a God who is in charge and all and in all. So what do we believe if we don't believe that about the Trinity? What do we believe to be the Trinity? We believe that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God eternally, from eternity past to eternity future, God eternally exists in three persons, which means before the world was created, God existed. But not only was it the Father that existed, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before the world was created existed. How do you measure eternity past? I said this morning, it's almost like before the beginning, beginninglessly, not that that's a word, but I'm making it up, and maybe I need to look at the dictionary later, but beginninglessly, over there, God was there. And over there, God will be there. God eternally, past, present, future, 
exists as three persons, not one person. The Father has been there, the Son has been there, the Holy Spirit has been there. And in the future, the Father is going to be there, the Son is going to be there, the Holy Spirit is going to be there. And each person in the triune, in the triune God, each person in the Godhead is fully God. The Father is not a fraction of God. He is the fullness of God. The Son is not a fraction of God. He is the fullness of God. And that's why in, Gal in Colossians 1.15 following, it says, and all the fullness of deity dwells in him. Means, meaning the Son. He's not part of, the, some people draw a pie or a pie chart and then they say he's that bit over there. No, he's not. He's the fullness. And the Holy Spirit is also the fullness. So how do you relate to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit is among us, the fullness of God is with us. If Jesus is the Son of God and he dies on the cross and he saves us, the fullness of God has come for our salvation. Which means we are to look at that and say God is God who eternally exists. It's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God. Now he has another statement that undergirds everything. And there is only one God. Do we understand that? I don't understand it, but you understand it, which is good. <laughs> now let's read Psalm 113 together. I hope that served as good foundation for us. Praise the Lord. That's how it starts. Do you know in Hebrew, praise the Lord, what that means, right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, which means hallelujah. It's space, yeah. It's God. Um, so praise the Lord. Which means you guys are saying it in Hebrew. I'm saying it in English. It's okay. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise. I feel more African today than I've ever felt in my life. Uh, praise, all servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high and above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who stoops down and looks from the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He makes them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Come on, you need to be saying hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's what he says there. Now, we're going to be looking at God the Father together. And this passage says, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from the time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Praise the Lord. Isaiah sees this God who is worthy of praise. He comes to the temple and he's coming not physically to the temple, he's in spirit, there's a vision of this God, and he encounters this God in the temple. And as he walks in, he sees the Lord high and exalted, and the train of his robe to fill the temple. And above him were these creatures, and these creatures that had six wings, and uh, they are called seraphim, plural, but one is called a seraph, and seraph means oh, fiery ones. These were creatures that were covered with fire. He sees them around the throne of God, and these creatures are called, or you could call them angels, and they are around the throne of God, and actually they're doing one thing. Okay, although with six wings, two wings they cover their faces, and with two wings they cover their feet, and with two wings they're flying around God, and uh, each calls to the other, and they call to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Most High. The whole earth is full of his glory. What is he seeing him? He is seeing what is going on in heaven. In heaven there is worship eternally. 
from the beginning when God created everything, from the moment these creatures were created, these fiery creatures that were created, and they saw God in the way that they saw him, and they were in the presence of the Holy God, in that moment, the only thing that they could do, the only posture they could have was a posture of praise and worship, which means these creatures have seen something we haven't seen. They have seen the glory of God. They've been so close to the glory of God that actually, as our example, what they do is they actually worship eternally. Now, we're not as close to God in terms of uh, proximity as they are. But it's interesting that they are doing something we probably think in sitting here today. So what is that all about? Why would they spend all their time just saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Most High. Why would they spend their time there? Let me tell you this. When you have actually encountered the living God, when you have come closer to him, when you have approached him and felt his power, when you have felt his presence, when the Father reveals himself to you, you would do nothing but fall on your face and worship him forever and you encounter him. What happens then is that God begins to reorient your thinking completely from a very inward-looking, self-indulgent to now God-looking and God-focused and God-worshipping. And I pray, my prayer is that here at City Gates, we will have an understanding of who the Father is. Because when we do, suddenly... Um, Worship is not just about two hours in church in order for us to get to, back to our really cool, busy time and the stuff that is so, so significant that we need to do after this. And by the way, if it's more than two hours or one and a half, I'm looking at my clock, I'm thinking this is taking such a long time right now. When you are in the presence of the living God, you realize that this is not an excuse for me going off t over time. But when you are in the presence of the living God, you realize that time is not the most important thing. When you are in the presence of the living God, you realize your schedule is nothing compared to him. You realize that everything that you guys have got planned and I've got planned after this is nothing compared to the holiness of God, who is above all things and is so glorious that creatures that have never sinned, have never committed sin, stand in his presence and they can't even look him in the eye, be cover their faces because he's too holy. And they can't even address him directly. They address one another and say, isn't he holy? and the other one says hey, he's holy and they keep going like that. These are not small creatures, by the way. Um, like, not normally, Christian iconography doesn't help, isn't it? All these stained glasses that we see in churches with all these paintings about God and all that because they paint, they, the seraphim, they, they look like little children that look chubby and babies with little, little, wings that come out, and they look very flush, they look like, you know, they, they're very cute. They look very cute. Seraphim, they're not cute. If you saw a seraphim, sorry, if you saw seraphim, at plural, you probably would want to bow down and try and worship even though it is not worthy of worship. These are massive. As they're calling out to God, the foundation of the whole temple shakes. That's how powerful the noise that comes from them. It breaks the sound barrier because of these huge creatures. And the Bible doesn't say that there were six and some paintings. To, they probably were a billion or a billion or billions. And all they do is spend time worshiping this one. Let me tell you, God is not in need of your praise and worship. He doesn't need it. Because he's already, the Father is already receiving perfect worship from creatures that are created to worship him. But, but worship is a privilege that we get to join them and actually come to him. Who are we to think that he's wasting our time by bringing us together like this to worship him and to praise him? We feel this, we are doing anyone a favor by coming like this? Who, if you come closer to him, you will understand that this God is not, is not the God you can make in your mind like Masio. He is a holy God who is exalted far above all things. Our Father is holy. He is holier than holy. And by the way, he deserves all the glory and all the worship and all the adoration that we need to give him. Father, receive all the glory. 
And my hope and my desire is that in this context, the Father will receive all the glory that he deserves. And then he goes on to say, the Lord is high above, verse 4, above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high? He's not just holy. The, God, the Lord is high above all things. He is exalted above the heavens. Can we just read these passages out loud together? Psalm 97, verse 9. Let's read them together. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Do you think we have gods in this earth? Do we think we have all gods that are made by humans, of gods of our thinking? He is exalted far above any other god. That's who he is. By the way, that's who he is. And he, he's exalted far above the heavens as well. Okay, if, the hev- if heaven was your, your, your kind of the image of God, that hey, he's there. No, he's above that. And that's what we need to know. And let's read 1 Chronicles 20. I love this one. It's just incredible, isn't it? It says, yours, Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. He is. He's exalted. He's head over all. That's who he is. That's who we are serving, guys. We're not serving the, 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 the God that looks like a... Sometimes we treat God like he's a little bit cute, isn't it? Like he's like my puppy that I put on here, and he tickles me, oh, God, this, to the... No, 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 he is holy, and he's... Yeah, sometimes he looks like that. Um, but actually, he's far above. He's exalted. And what that means, he means he's the almighty God, which means no might, no power, no strength comes anywhere close to our God's strength. And there's, there are things he doesn't share with any God. There are things he doesn't share with us. There are attributes about God that he doesn't share with anyone. He chooses to have them to himself. He's the all-knowing God. God knows everything. You, did you know that? Did you know everything you've ever done, God knows that? You didn't know that. Okay, that's fine. Um, do you know that God knows everything that's ever happened in the past? And no other God knows that. Do you know that God knows everything that's going to happen in the future? And no other God knows that. Only he knows that. Do you know God is more powerful than any power that's ever been created? Do you know that there's, uh, there, even the, the stars and everything that's been created, he tells Job, everything comes out of his mouth. That ball of fire called the sun, which is so powerful, and now uh, we rely on here, It comes out of his mouth. He makes it. He speaks and he's created. He's above all things. He's above all creation. He's our God. And also, he's the God who is eternal. That's why we call him the Alpha and Omega, which means beginninglessly, as I said, he was there. And he doesn't share eternity past with any of us. Eternity past, there was only God. And eternity future there will be God. No other God ever existed in eternity past. He doesn't share that with anyone. He doesn't share their unchangeability. Is that a word? Is that even a word? It is. Okay, cool. I'm working on my dictionary as I'm speaking to you. He doesn't share that with anyone. Everything changes. Everything evolves and changes and, and takes different shape. Hey, when I got married, I looked different to how I look now, okay? I had a little bit of, uh, you could see, and I was quite toned and all that, and since then I've changed a lot. Um, uh, you laugh. If we were to put a collage of pictures of every single one of you 10 years ago, you look very different to how you look now, yeah? You've changed. Your circumstances have changed. Your family situations have changed. Your, everything changes. Everything's going to change. Creation has changed. The, the, the earth has changed. The planet, has, everything is changing, isn't it? It's all in a state of flux. You can't trust it. The ground you're standing on is not stable. Do you know who is stable? Do you know who is constant? Who doesn't change and remains the same forever? Our God. 
He remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And no other, no other is like that. And also, you all depend on something or someone. You depend on something. The reason you were born is you didn't choose to be born. Because you depended on your parents for you to be born. And that's why you are here. And even gods, the gods that we worship or are worshipped, some of them, we put them on the altar. They depend on us. But there's only one God who doesn't depend on anyone. He doesn't need anyone. And he doesn't share that with anyone. He's independent in every way. And even when I know young people say, I just want my independence. I'm going to leave the house now. And um, I don't want to stay with my parents. I want my independence. The reality is you're dependent on so much around you. We all are. But hey, why don't we depend on the one who is very faithful and trustworthy? The one who is true and stable. The one who is constant, is unchanging, and who will remain the same forever. This God is high above all things. He's exalted. He doesn't share his glory with anyone, and his glory belongs to him alone. Let's come to him. Why do you panic in life when you can trust him? Why do you run after all sorts of saving powers of the world, whether it's money, whether it's your job, whether it's things that the world has told us that it can give us security. Why don't you rely on the one who doesn't change, who's secure and true in every way? That's our Father. That's the one we serve. He's up there and exalted. Amen? Amen. Let's keep reading. And then he says, he stoops down from heaven and earth, and he raises the poor from the dust and lifts them from the ash heap. Hey, although he's so exalted, he's far above He's over all things. This God, the Bible says, he stoops down. Okay? He's up there. He's not like your little Jack Russell dog that you can treat him like that. He's holy, but he actually stoops down. He comes to us. He comes to minister to us. God, who's holy, doesn't need to bow to anyone, doesn't need to stoop down to any, stoops down to us. And how does he do that? He comes to live among us. He comes to be so close to us. He's not just an absentee landlord who's up in the sky somewhere that we worship and he's over there and doesn't come here. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, now suddenly they say, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking among them. He comes and stoops down for Adam and Eve. When the Israelites were in Egypt, he came and he stoops down and he was among them and he led them out and he put them on Mount Sinai on Horeb and the, the whole mountain was covered with smoke. The mountain was shaking. Why? Because God was coming to be among them. And then he establishes what we call a tabernacle and he tabernacles among them and he lives among them, the holy God. And then later on, the Bible talks about how, hey, the word came and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the one and only son of God. Jesus, sent by the father. The father stoops down by sending Jesus to come and walk the dusty streets of the Middle East and walked among us. Suddenly, God is among us. And now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is not just among us. The Bible tells us that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, which means God no longer just lives among us. God lives in us. So if you are here today <laughs> and you think that God is distant, let me tell you that God is here. God is with you. All of us together here, plural, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that God is here right now? And God lives in you. Which means Christianity is not about just going to, uh, for a Sunday meeting to meet with God. Okay? Christianity is about the God who meets you every day. 
from the rising of the sun to the time that it serves. You can say, praise the Lord. And you are not just saying praise the Lord, you are meeting the living God who dwells in you. You are talking to him. You are communicating with him because the Father has come to be with us in the spirit. So God, he stoops down and he will always do that for us. God is of us. And what does he do? He lifts, he raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ashes, and he sits them with princes, with the princes of his people. Suddenly, God is among the needy. God is among the poor. He's with us. He's our loving, gracious, compassionate Father. He's with us right now. He reveals himself. Did you know that God is love? Did you know that? Oh, you didn't know that. That's fine. God is love. 1 John 4, 16. He doesn't stoop down because he just feels sorry for us. Everything that God does is because of his love. Love is not God. God is love. We don't worship love. We worship God who is love. God has always been love. He was love before the world was created. And let me tell you, who did God love? God loved God. The Father loved the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit loved the Father. God didn't need to create us in order to demonstrate his love. The love that we receive is the overflow of what is going on in the triune God. And what we're experiencing is how amazing the Father loves the Son, that that love is shared with us. And if that's the case, and we experience the love of God here, that love needs to permeate from us and go into other people as well. So God is love. And by the way, that's why everything that God he does flows out of his love. God's justice flows out of his love. God's compassion flows out of his love. The reason God stoops down is because of his love. God's grace and mercy, we heard last week what mercy and grace, what they mean. God giving us what we don't deserve and God not giving us what we deserve. All of that flows out of his love. The reason he stoops down and he lifts the poor from the ash here is because of his love. That's why in Deuteronomy 5, the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt. And what does God do? The Bible talks about they cried out to the Lord and he came down and he led them with his outstretched arm. When you, he, he led them with a pillar of cloud and fire and established them on the mount. All that he did with the Israelites was a demonstration of who he is, which is a demonstration of love. And not only that, the Israelites are wondering why God did it. And they say, why did you choose us? Deuteronomy 7. He says, I didn't choose you because you were more numerous than other nations. In fact, let me tell you this, you were fewer than other nations. But I chose you to be my chosen people, my treasured possession, because I love you. God chose you because he loves you. It wasn't because of what you've done. It was because he is love. And that's why he chose each and every one of us today. And if you know that, if we know that love is, God is full of love, all that we do, our motivation for all that we do won't be because we want to please. It's because love overflows out of us. Amen? But Jesus talks about the Father. In Luke 15, Jesus says, let me tell you who the Father is. How does he tell you who the Father is? He uses the story of the lost son. Remember that? Or the, what we call the, the prodigal son. He talks about two sons and their father. He said, let me tell you what God is like. Let me tell you what the Father is like. And he says, one of them goes, very much like us, isn't it? And he squanders his inheritance. He asks, oh God, I know how to handle myself. And he goes, how? We love to be independent of God. And he goes and he squanders everything. And he comes to the lowest moment, almost like with, with the pigs, which means 
the ash heap. And then he realized, he comes to his senses and he wants to go back to the Father. And Jesus said, that's what you are like. And when you came to the Father, the glorious, amazing, exalted, awesome Father, do you know what he did? God stooped down for the Son. He came and ran and came for every single one of you. And what did he do? He clothed him with the cloak of righteousness. You today here are clothed with his righteousness. And he does that because of his love. He covers your sin. He removes them. And suddenly when you look at you, we see the Father reflected in you. And not only does he do that, he gives you the sandals, the feet of your, the, the, sorry, the the shoes on your, on your feet are the shoes that God has given you. He gives you dignity. He clothes you with dignity. But he doesn't just do that. He puts a ring on your finger, a royal ring on your finger, which means he doesn't just lift the paw from the ash sheep from the pigs. He sits them with princes, with the princes of his people. So now you don't, you're not just, I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Uh, it means I've escaped hell. No, it's not that. It means you are royal. It means you are seated with the sun. It means you are in, like seated with the princes of this. God has made you royal. He has chosen you today. The reality is we probably are living like the, young, the older brother. We now are saved by grace through faith, but we still don't understand the heart of the Father and what he's done for us. Because most of the time, we live like the older brother, what do we think of the older brother? The older brother was with the father the whole time. And you can think of that he's the, he's the well, he's the good guy. But actually, I think he was the worst, worse than the, the younger brother. So how could you be worse than going out and eating with the pigs? The older, the older brother stayed with the father. And although we think he loved the father, he didn't love the father. He loved all that the father can give him. And that's why he stuck around. And it's all that is of the father. That's why he says, this son of yours went away and squandered. He doesn't even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours. You see where his heart is? His heart is not with the father. And now, what are you doing for me? Almost as if it's all about the son performing in order for the father to love the son. It's not about performance. The Father loves you because He loves you. And sometimes, because of our relationships with our earthly fathers, sometimes we approach God like that. Like, if I do these things, God will be favorable towards me. God will love me. Let me tell you all, this is a lie from the pit of hell because God loves you because he chose you, because he's treasured possession, because he loves you. The Father's love is overwhelming, and he loves you because he loves you. Imagine your Emily is not here. She heard that I was talking about her in the first meeting, so she decided to do the runner. That's why she's not here now. Um, <laughs> but uh, imagine Emily, I said to Emily, I love you. And then she says, why? Which often is the case, isn't it, ladies? I'm interested to know what the guys say. I'm not asking you to go home now and, and practice the exercise, but uh, why do you love me? If I say, ah, it's because you look like this, because you have that, because you have that, the reality is, in a few years' time, she's going to change. And would you still be saying that? Unless you have this love that has been passed on to you that is unconditional that motivates you to love because you are loved. Those who are loved, love much. And if we understand the love of the Father, then we will love and give ourselves to loving others. But if we don't, it will be based on the conditions. Does he do that? Did he do that? No, the Father doesn't love like that. He loves in a very different way. Hey, let me tell you this. You are loved. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, you are unconditionally loved. But here we are. God doesn't just love us. He's not just compassionate and reaches to us. He's not just merciful and full of grace and loves us because he loves us unconditionally. But he's also 
put that love into our hearts so that we might bear his image and love the way he loves. And Jesus wasn't just saying, hey, this is what God is like. Look at Luke 15. Look at the story of the two sons. He was also saying, if you see me, you see the Father, because I love just as the Father. And I hope the world will be able to say, and your friends and people around you will be able to say, I know the Father because of the love I receive from you. That's why the Bible says, as we have opportunity, let us not grow weary in doing good. Let us never grow weary. Let's demonstrate the love of the Father if we understand the love of the Father. But we will withhold the love of the Father and base everything on people's actions and reactions if we don't fully understand the love of the Father. But let me just say this. Galatians 6, it says, never grow weary in doing good, in showing the love of the Father. And then he doesn't finish there. And then he says, as you have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of faith. And I hope that that's what we would do. Convergence is coming soon. A great opportunity to not grow weary or lose heart, but to demonstrate the love of the Father in all that we are doing. And many years ago, and it's many years, I wasn't living in Dubai. I was visiting Dubai for the Harp Conference. Who remembers the Harp Conference? It was great. I was living in Dubai. I was not living in Dubai, and I came here for the Harp Conference. And a couple who were part of the church at the time, they opened their home for me to come and stay with them. And it was amazing because they didn't grow weary or lose heart. They had this opportunity. They, they showed love to me. And you, know, you never know what God does through demonstrations of God's love. And I'm pleased to announce to you that that couple are seated here at the front here, and we are leading city gates together with them. And that's Pete and Liz. <laughs> Let us not grow weary in doing good. Let us not grow weary and demonstrate the love of the Father. But we will only do that if we understand love. The second thing that happened to me, I was living in Dubai. I had my own apartment, and uh, the hub came again. And we were looking for people who can host people, very much like we are doing today. And Katie gave us an amazing plug for those who want to host. And, and for me, <laughs> you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira? You know that? Yeah, okay, there are two couples in the Bible. The first one is Ananias and Sapphira that sometimes God speaks to me about. And the second one was Priscilla and Aquila. What did Ananias and Sapphira do? When God was calling them to show good, to show his love, to demonstrate it, they said to the church, I don't think they deserve our, we just sold our field. Why should we give it to the church? What if they squander it? What if, what if they do? Do we even know what they're doing with the money? And then Peter came and they said, no, we have nothing. And Peter said, no, we have nothing. They talked about it and they decided to conspire. And they thought they were conspiring against Peter, but they were conspiring against God. Remember, the Bible says, you didn't lie to men, you lied to God. <gasps> and the second couple, I'm not trying to scare you with Ananas and Sapphira right? for some kind of obedience, by the way. Okay, I'm not. And the second couple was Priscilla and Aquila. These cu this couple were incredible. And they said to Paul, what would you like us to do? And Paul said, here's Apollos. They said, we, we will disciple him. Apollos, come for a meal into, to our house. And they sat down and taught him and discipled him and helped him and saw him grow. And then later, it says the church was hosted in their house in Rome. They opened their home, and they understood that as we have opportunity, let us be good to all, especially to those who belong to the family of faith. So my opportunity came. And Steve Oliver was going through a list of people that he wanted to, to get people to host. You want to sit for this story because it's going to be great. And, and, and he said, he said, Fusi, have you got room in your house? I did. I was Ananias and Sapphiring over there. Is that even a phrase? Sapphiring, yeah. Suffering. 
over there. <laughs> and I, I said, yeah, reluctantly. I said, can you host people? I didn't know who I was going to host. And uh, I also volunteered to go and pick people up from the airport, which I did. And so those two things, remember what Gabriel was talking about. And uh, I picked up this uh, four young Chinese people who came to the Hub Conference. That's what I did. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to those who would belong to the family of faith. And, uh, and I picked them up and uh, took them. And uh, this young man, his name is Tong Sing. He's, uh, in English, he's, he's, he calls himself Paul. He's from China. So he's staying in my house. And, and it was amazing because he, didn't, he's, he, he hardly spoke English. And, and at the time, we didn't have Google Translate. It was many years ago. And uh, I tell you what, we just kind of worked it out. And let me tell you why I'm telling you. I mean, it's twofold. The first thing is uh, here is Tong Sing in a polo shirt, the white polo shirt. He came to Dubai many years ago, and now uh, we established contact, and we talked. Tong Sing has since moved. He's now in Japan, and he's an engineer for Japanese cars. He works on one of the Japanese cars, um, uh, car manufacturers. So he, he does all the interiors and stuff. So he moved to Japan, and he, we, we've been in touch. And then I, I'm in Durham in the UK, and a couple come to me, and they say, do you know anyone who is in Japan because we are just about to move to Japan? I was like, um, I don't know anyone. Oh, the Son Sing I met at the Hub Conference that I hosted a few years ago. And then I got in touch. This is the couple on the left. Son Sing since got married, so that's his wife. And this is the couple, John and Chris. Uh, Chris was going to go and build a rocket in, uh, in, in, in Japan. She's a rocket scientist. I know they exist. Um, she's a rocket scientist, so she went to build a rocket with the Japanese space, whatever, and, uh, and, yeah, no, and he's a professor of maths, so he went to teach uh, maths in one of the universities and, uh, as a couple. I wonder what they talk about this couple, you know? He's a professor of maths, he built a rocket science, <laughs> and they were elders in one of our church, he was an elder in one of our churches in Durham, so they've since moved to Japan. And because of what happened here in Dubai, they are now starting a small group which could potentially become a church over here. As we have opportunities, let us do good to all and reflect the love of the Father if we understand Him. The second thing that happened was... Whew, Nelson, why are you blushing this moment? You're not meant to be blushing. I'm the one that's supposed to be. The second thing that happened, that in that group, there was only one lady who could speak English. And, uh, and everything I was talked to about Son Singh was through this young lady. And I tell you what, God is amazing. He has a sense of humor. And this picture that I'm about to show you was the result of opening my home. And she, she believes that. Um, it's okay. Honestly, it's okay. Isn't that amazing? The Father loves this. Our Heavenly Father loves this. It's amazing. Just open. As we have opportunity, let me ask you, I wonder what your story is going to be. I wonder in the next five years, yeah, yeah, my story is unique and different. I wonder what your story is going to be. I wonder if you demonstrate the love of the Father and you open your home, pick people up from the airport, the conversations in between. I wonder where they will lead. And at the moment, maybe you are ananising and suffering, and you're kind of trying to work out, what if, I'm not even coming to that conference. Um, I'm not, did you know how much they charge? Did you know that... All of these murmuring, hey guys, only if you understood the love of the Father, you'll be like Priscilla and Aquila. Where can we serve at a conference? Is there anyone we can pay for? We have an extra room where we can host someone. What am I doing? I'm preparing you that immediately after this, you go to that table over there, 
and you go and put your name as you have opportunity. Let us do good to all men, especially to those who belong to the family of faith. What are we doing there? We are demonstrating the love of the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave of himself, his son, to come and die for us. Mission flows out of God's love. Sacrifice from the heaven flows out of the love of the Father. And hey, has God asked you to do things that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Maybe he's dealing with things in your heart in bringing you into alignment with the Father. And lastly, he, he not only raises the poor from the airship, I'm finishing now, but also he gives the barren woman a home, making her joyous mother of her children. God restores. He's the restoring God. For a lot of you here, and I share that, I didn't have a great relationship with my dad. I worked, I felt like in my upbringing that I was like a soldier, you know, wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning and uh, I'm already up and out and about and stuff like that. It was very much driven. And God had to heal me many years later of that sort of relationship. For some of you, God wants to, he doesn't just, res he restores the barren woman, but he also restores relationships with fathers here. Maybe he was going to restore your heart from the upbringing and the things that you've experienced as you maybe interacted with your earthly biological father. But he restores us all because he's a very, very loving father. Let's stand up together. I need to bring this to a close. I am already late. And, uh, but I want to pray for fathers here, if I can do that. Can I do that? Can we do that? Okay, good. I'm going to explain myself better this time. The first meeting, I explained myself, and it wasn't good enough. And I'm going to explain myself. If you are a father, stay where you are. If you are not a father, come out of your seat, and let's form a circle around fathers out here. Can we do that? Let's do that quickly. If you are not a father, if you are, come on, let's do that very quickly. A circle around here. Let's hold hands if, you, if you're uncomfortable with holding hands. Hey, fathers, where are you going? You're not supposed to go to the fringe. You're supposed to stay in the middle. It's, okay, let's come closer. Marina is okay. She doesn't bite. Let's come closer. Anyone, ladies, come on. Let's come around. If you are a lady here, and come around. Mary. It's nice when I know your name. <laughs> Goodness, we haven't got many fathers. It's like Paul saying, you have many guardians, but not many fathers. But I hope at City Gates, God will heal and create a beautiful, healthy understanding of fathers. But we want to pray. The world needs fathers. And I like, can we have... Amazing fathers in our midst. And if you are a father here and you feel like, yeah, I've blown it. I didn't do well. God wants to restore you. He wants to restore your heart. And if you are here today and you think, oh my goodness me, I wish I could be a father. For some of the young men in the fringe here, why don't you pray that in your heart? You say, Lord, help me to be a good father. But can all of us just stretch out our hands and pray for those who are fathers? There's a lot of restoration here, fathers, that you might want to, even as they're praying for you now, you might think, yeah, I've blown it. I tell you what, you have a loving God. He will restore us. I want to stand here myself. Can we all just pray for all the fathers here? Let's do that. Just where you are. Holy Spirit, come in this moment. Come and do something powerful in this. Come and bring healing right now. Restore daughters and sons to their fathers. Heal broken relationships. Set us free 
from anger, from manipulation, and from bitterness as fathers. Rescue us from the lies of the enemy. Remove strongholds from fathers here. Lord, I pray that City Gates will be a church where fathers are present, fathers are loving, fathers are so generous, and fathers are so sacrificial. Lord, I pray, heal every father here. Heal their story, that they'll have a different story. If you are here as a father, just pray in your heart. But maybe God is not just calling you to be a, a good biological father. Maybe he's calling you to be a good spiritual father. Just ask God to heal you. Thank you, Jesus. Celebrate that. If you are here today, and I've been talking about a good and loving Heavenly Father, and you think, I, I don't know how to relate to him because my father was not like that. Can you just raise up your hand? I want us to pray for an amazing healing for those of us who think, I've never had that relationship with my father. Not the ones in the, in, in the middle here, but to those of you in the circle and also those who in the middle. If you never had a good relationship with your father, it's not embarrassing. In nowadays, it's normal and it shouldn't be. Why don't you just raise up your hand? I want us to pray, if that's you. Don't, don't raise it up like this. Raise it up like this. Let's not be ashamed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you lay hands on them if you, they are around you? And just pray for them. This is a holy moment. God is here. He's bringing healing, sweeping across the room and healing right now. God wants to heal you. He wants you to know the Father intimately. He wants you to have a really good relationship with the Father. If that's you, lift up your hands. Just receive from the Father and let others minister to you right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Set us free here now. Remove, Lord, all the disappointments. Remove, Lord, all the bitterness in our hearts. Remove the unforgiveness. Remove, Lord, all that's left of us. Lord, I pray right now. Everything that we still haven't dealt with right now. Holy Spirit, break it right now in Jesus' name. Break it right now. I feel like God, it's almost like there's something in the atmosphere, spiritual atmosphere that's been broken today once and for all. And it's almost like the, the love of the Father is poured out into our hearts. And we're going to know God differently to how we've always known Him. We're going to relate to God in a new way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. While those who are praying for others are still praying, I want all of us to come to the Lord's table and let's, I know we could stay, sit, stand like this forever and just be coming before our Heavenly Father, but why don't we do that in a form of communion? Just where you are, there's some bread and Wine, let's do that. Let's draw closer to the Father. And um, there's uh, something over there, something over here, something over there, something over here. Let's, let's do that quickly together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I tell you what, if God is doing something in your life today, don't rush off. If someone has been praying for you, let that continue. The Holy Spirit is ministering to us. Let's allow him to. After you've taken the bread. Yeah, can we have the band ready to lead us straight away? Mm, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. The Lord Jesus, sent by the Father, in the upper room, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and ate it. This is his body broken for us so that we might know the sacrifice of our Heavenly Father. And today, before you do that, why don't you examine your heart? 
you might be here angry with God. God wants to deal with that right now. Maybe you are here, you are angry with your earthly father. God wants you to release that right now before you take this bread. Come, Holy Spirit, minister to us. And Father, I pray as we take this bread, Lord, may we reflect on what you have accomplished through your loving, gracious Son on the cross for us. Thank you for dying, Jesus Christ. Let's take the bread. And he took the, the drink, the wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it and distributed for them to drink. Father, this drink represents here the blood of your son spilled on the cross, the blood of the new covenant in your blood. I pray today, Lord, that we will know that we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And if the Son has set us free, we are free indeed, so that we might have a lasting, everlasting relationship with the Father. Lord, as we drink this drink right now, I pray, would you do a mighty, powerful work in us that we might know who you are. Let's take the drink. Praise the Lord. Let's praise him together. Amen.